I want to buy a copy of Bone Storm. Here's 99 cents. Uh, allow me to summarize the proposed transaction. You wish to purchase Bone Storm for 99 cents. Net profit to me, negative $59. Oh, oh, please take my $59. I don't want it. It's yours. It, it, it. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. We've been doing a lot of comic book retrospectives here on the channel, talking about kind of some of the classic story arcs, you know, your Raza Ghoul Saga, Avengers Defenders War, Kree Scroll War. Today, we thought we would just kind of zoom in on a character and do two classic comic issues. Today, we're going to talk about Flash Essentials, Flash number 54, and then Flash, uh, what is it, 123? Mm -hmm. Yep. And here to talk with me about that are my two partners in crime, Eric, the comic book hoarder. How are you doing today? Doing well. And also with us is comic book writer, award-winning editor, Joe Corrala. How are you doing? I'm all right, Wes. Uh, just got to clarify, though. Did you mean for that Zoom pun earlier, or it just it just happened? just happens. Right. I, I'm, these well, things, the host. I'm natural. They just flow out of me. <laughs> <laughs> so you would think Flash 54 would take place before Flash 123, but that would not be the case. Flash 123 is a Barry Allen story, and Flash 54 is a Wally West story. Flash 123 is the Flash of Two Worlds, and Flash 54 is no, is it No One Dies? That's the name, right? Yes. Nobody dies, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nobody dies. So we'll go into the older one first, even though, Joe, I know Flash 54, I think, is like one of your five favorite comics ever, maybe? It's 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 up there. In terms of single store like one and dones you can just hand to someone if they're like i don't know anything about the flash or i don't know anything like here you go just uh <laughs> you know it's 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 great but but yeah no of course you got to talk about the flash of two worlds uh now first. this is classic this is gardner fox carmine infantino mm -hmm. on art and there's a lot of things happening this is essentially the the first appearance of the multiverse where yeah. they kind of start spelling it out yeah, it's uh, it's also happened on uh, Paul Kupperberg's birthday, June fourteenth. But um, <laughs> it's it's interesting because yeah, I mean technically it started from showcase number four when they mention that um, the Flash existed as like an imaginary tale, and that the they existed in their world as like you know comic books and and all that, and that's where. Um, Barry got the name Flash. He was like, oh, I really like these comics with, uh, you know, these Flash comics, so I'm going to call myself the Flash. But, um, but yeah, this is where it affirms that you can travel between these two worlds and there's different characters and, and, and all that in uh, Flash 123. A another funny thing, too, is, you know, they decided to continue flash at the higher numbers at um you know it started after it was off showcase it went to 105 to continue from the golden age uh comics the idea being it would be horrible to go to a number one because at the time the notion was you never want to put out a number one you want to find ways to have a comic come out at a higher number so that way people will buy it because the mentality was different or the perceived mentality of of the fans uh wanting to pick up something that had legs it had longevity to it you know that you know there there was something about a high number that fans they, confidence that it's yes, gonna be there yeah. exactly and the, not but when they didn't have the luxury of continuing a series even though they did, they could have, in theory, done that with with Green Lantern. Mm -hmm. but Green Lantern, Justice League, Hawkman, Adam, Teen Titans, and there may be one or two that I'm forgetting, did not have the number one on the number on the first issues. Yeah, they were just hoping people would just see it and go, "Oh, okay, this came out," and not realize that they hadn't been buying it all along. So you think <laughs> about how much the industry's changed. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So talk about this Flash 123. If you're looking to introduce somebody mm -hmm. to the origins of Barry Allen and Jay Garrick, you're going to get them both in this story, which I think is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then the other cool thing about this, Joe, is essentially Gardner Fox writes himself in as a DC canon character. Yeah, before there was Grant Morrison, decades before 
there was uh, Grant Morrison writing comics. There was a uh, Gardner Fox putting himself in into these comics because he was known for writing the original Golden Age uh, character. And um, you know, I don't know all the ins and outs of what they did behind the scenes, but you know, it made sense that they were courteous enough to have Gardner Fox write this particular issue because at this time it was mostly Bob Kaniger, I think, some John Broom. Um, John Broom, I think, was mostly doing the Green Lantern stuff with uh, Gil Kane at the time. And this was mostly Bob Kaniger and Carmine Infantino doing Flash, which uh, really, like, I'll, I'll, I'll let Eric talk about the, the true origins of the Silver Age. But uh, in, in terms of just the on the creative end, the um, reaction to what led us to the silver age it was really spearheaded at dc in in large part by people like bob kaniger carmen infantino john broom and, and and gil kane all right breed so just talking about flash 123 obviously you did not read this as a kid this came out well before <laughs> you started reading comic books but when you first discovered it i imagine at the time it was still like kind of an eye-opener you know it's it's a lot of fun, but you're getting a lot of new concepts, and it's it's just this is one of the funnest comics we've certainly read so far in these yeah. retrospectives. It is the funnest comic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, DC in those days, you know, aimed at young young children. So it, it, as early as the first page of the story, where you've got the little hands pointing to what you're supposed to look at, and every time Barry turns into the Flash, they mention like you know. Who, yeah, Barry Allen, who is secretly the Flash, so they I mean, they they kind of well, they walk you through the stories because, like I said, the audience they were going for is very young. Now, how you know people my age can still enjoy it today is you look past that and you see like the the concepts of the stories, even though the stakes were fairly simple. I mean, the bad guys wanted to rob a bank or rob the museum. It was never I'm gonna you know kill the Flash. You know, blah blah blah. And in this in this issue, is a you know um, Iris is talking to Barry, who thinks he's going to get yelled at for being late again because that was a running gag. The fastest man alive can never be on time. They're like he's got and, the Spider Man yeah, guilty conscience yeah. that I'm always, I'm always late. And, and yep. she goes, "Well, no, not this time." Barry said, "The the magician that was supposed to play for the orphans can't make it." And he goes, "Well, I just happened to see the Flash. This was before Iris knew who he was." You know, at the police station, and let me see if I can get him to come entertain the children. So he does, and I guess Iris hadn't studied the jawline because she has no idea that that's her boyfriend. Um, but he he performs for the children, and as he's doing a rope trip, he, trick, he vibrates so fast, he basically catapults himself into the other and onto Earth too, where when he figures out you know where he is and he's not back in time. He goes to a, new, a newsstand holding the Keystone City paper and says, Where's Keystone City? And the guy goes, What are you, a nut? He goes, You're standing in it. So he looks up Jay Garrick's number, who it, it's listed in the phone book mm -hmm. because no one would ever think to look it up. Yeah, you know, one of his old enemies would never think to look for him there. <laughs> but and he goes and, and meets him, and you know, and he's talking about how he he was he's considered coming out of retirement. And meanwhile, three of his old villains. <clears throat> the wizard, the shade, and the fiddler are I plotting. The thinker. The th I'm sorry. The thinker. Th yeah. Yeah. Um, are plotting nefarious deeds of their own, and which they they hatch their plan. And you know, in true DC fashion, they fight them individually at first and lose, mm. and then the inevitable team up, where they you know win the day, and yes, you know, stop the plans and. Then they, you know. All right, Derek, I gotta, hold, I gotta hold on. You're going through the whole comic issue. We haven't even had a, a t chance to talk <laughs> about this thing. It's amazing. So we get these yeah. three villains. Mm -hmm. They're awesome. We get the thinker, and he's got like his, <laughs> his thinking cap. It looks like a salad bowl he's gonna put on his head, mm -hmm. and he can make anyone with like 50 <laughs> meters of him. You see whatever he wants you to see. You got this the fiddler, he's got an upgraded Stradivarius violin. You know, and he can, uh, you know, basically make you kind of do what you want. And then the shade has like this upgraded cane. I love these villains, Joe, because they're so simple. They're just fun. Yeah. 
and they don't have these super tragic backstories where I think, you know what, the thinker might be right here. He's just kind of evil and he wants to steal stuff. And yeah. It makes it like Eric was saying earlier, these are written for, for a younger audience. It's mm-hmm. very easy to see who's the good guy and the bad guy. No, for sure. I love these characters so much. I got this shade sketch from John Brolia uh, a, a few years ago. Uh, I believe he's the artist on Zombie Sama from, from Billy Tucci. But, uh, you know, yeah, these, these characters are great. The Thinker is, is going to be in a big blockbuster movie, uh, you know, played by one of the doctors. So that's something. Um, yeah, I, I do love these characters. Uh, and, and even the the current rogues gallery that was being built up uh, as as we're coming along in Flash, like he's already got Captain Cold, the Trickster, the Pied Piper, Mirror Master, Weather Wizard. Uh, those are all villains he, he's already racked up in a very short period. Gorilla Grodd, uh, of course, uh, a lot of of stellar memorable rogues have already been added to the flash mythos before this issue kid flash wally west has already been introduced the elongated man um there's there is so much here and this all happened before fantastic four number one which wouldn't hit the stands for another month or two after this issue came out to put it all in perspective and a quick aside there's an issue of the Teen Titans when it was revived in the mid seventies, where they brought the 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 Fiddler into yeah the Earth One, and he literally tools around in a Fiddler mobile. Absolutely yes. beautiful. He's this, he's got that in this one. Well, first we'll, we'll talk about the Thinker because like like Eric said, they like the three villains are working together, but they decide they're going to do their own plots. One of them's going to take over a museum, and one of them's going to steal this or that. Mm-hmm. But the th- the thinker one's great because he decides with his thinking cap he's going to train these dogs to attack Jay Garrick when he when he sees him. Obviously, he doesn't know that there's another Flash in town. And but when Jay Garrick shows up, the dogs start talking to him. Did the thinker accidentally train the dogs how to speak? Is that what happened, Joe? Did Eric? Did anybody? I'm gonna I'm gonna double check that page now because <laughs> I'm like I'm like I I remember what you're saying, but I'm like hmm. So. Then he shows up and the dogs are like, he's stealing the the whatever um the Neptune something. The Neptune cup. Oh, That's people are Jake... always stealing the Neptune cup, you know. <laughs> now now th- th- this was the thinker part, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm guessing he just uh made the flash believe that they were talking because that was part of his power set. Yeah, but the yeah. dogs told what he did what he was doing. Well, yeah, because he 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 in his mind, I'm sure he knew he had a way to stop him. Well, the I don't know. I thought he was training the dogs to attack him, but when he sees him, they're like, "Hey, what's up?" He, he's stealing yeah. stuff. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, because it's a, it's a. He was mentally dominating the watchdogs. Uh, the yeah, the thinker projected the image of the Flash and you know elicited a command to them, and and then they they called out to the Flash. You know, huh? Am I hearing things? Those dogs talking. You know, it's, um, you know, and this is before the summer of Sam, by the way. I just want to make sure everyone knows that. It was just such a weird moment. I was like, Did, is the thinker so stupid he accidentally trained the dogs to turn him in? Or or maybe he thought the Flash was so stupid that he couldn't find him if they could wouldn't have dogs to tell him where to go. <laughs> but they, there's a big yeah. confrontation between the thinker and, and, um, and Jay Garrick and Jay's finally kind of figures out who he is because he's projecting himself all over the room. And once he does that, I guess he puts up like a sight, a psionic force field or something. And as soon as he hits it, he like kind of knocks himself out and the bad guy gets away. And then yeah. we get to the fiddler story, and he's in the fiddler car, the fiddler mobile, you whatever you want to call it. And this is where we get kind of the big classic imagery from this. And he's like playing his fiddle and he's destroying like all these windows. And finally, this girder's coming down, it's gonna destroy this guy. And I think Jay Garrett kind of like moves him out of the way as Barry Allen moves it. And we get this classic image. I know, Joe, you've got something that you want to show us, right? I, I do. I, I had an artist, uh, Sean Von Gorman, do um, the Flash of Two Worlds cover in that image. But it's Elvis Presley and Elvis Costello. The Elvis of Two Worlds as the girder is coming down. <laughs> 
right? You know, my aim is true. Yeah, it's funny why she said, you know, I didn't even realize that he was in the Fiddler Mobile. Mm. Because in the Teen Titans, you got all kinds of view, you know, angles of it. This one, you only get one stat. Yeah, from the side and I, I just caught the, yeah, the, um, the idea. <laughs> so, but then, yeah, that's a, that, that part's really fun, and that's where we get the big iconic image. Then finally, Eric, the three villains get together, and we get the final confrontation. Well, remember before that, when the two get together to compare notes, you know, they realize that there's more than one Flash. Because they said, mm -hmm. you know, this new Flash was younger. He had a red suit. He goes, what are you talking about? The Flash looked the same as he did all, you know, all I made a little older. And they go, yeah, we better adjust our plans because we can handle one Flash, but two might be too much for us. And so yeah, then they so, do a, the final so they, They're yeah, going they to steal jewels from the Keystone Museum. That's the, the big final act. Of, of the three villains, we got Thinker, Fiddler, and the Shade in there. And the Fiddler, he's he's like using his fiddle and, and they're dancing and he's making the Flashes actually steal the jewels. It was actually a lot of fun. But he commanded them to obey him, but they he forgot to command them not to try to escape. So when they were get when he said ignore the small jewels, they were smart enough to put them in their ears and disrupt the frequencies so they could stop the nefarious evildoers in their tracks absolutely very fun comic book way to to thwart their villains there joe we don't yeah. get fun stuff like this anymore no and then they have more fun together in a uh, flash uh, 129 uh where you know they're in uh barry's earth fighting uh captain cold and uh trickster uh trickster popularized by uh mark hamill of course yeah. but beautiful performance in the last <laughs> but but yeah and and they would continue to to go about the the two worlds quite a bit it was popular Pe people enjoyed it um and, and those were full length uh issues uh you know they They'd advertise those things in some books as, you know, like a comic novel length adventure because there were no backups. It was, you know, just the the whole story. You didn't get an elongated man or a kid flash backup in in uh, Flash 123. And if you and if there wasn't a backup schedule, there would be two 12 page stories. Yeah, because I guess they figured the kids may not always have the attention span for 24. Yeah. So they had so to really they, make sure they did something special if they wanted to keep the kids' attention for an entire book. Yes. So when they wrap up 123, Barry and Jay say goodbye. When Barry goes back, he's looking to tell Gardner Fox so he can tell another Jay Garrick story. And we find out that uh, somehow Gardner is like tapped into the vibrations of the other Earth. And that's how he knows the stories of Jay Garrick. And he's been writing these Flash comics his whole life. So just a ton of fun. Uh, this is obviously a classic comic book. What what kind of uh, sets us apart, Joe? Why is this one special? I, I mean, it sets up uh, stuff that uh, we're dealing with in DC to this very day. Uh, you, you know, really, you, you know, putting that stake in the ground for there's a multiverse. We have, uh, you know, our golden age characters are, are still in the silver age. You know, like all that is, is really important. Uh, for what DC would do uh, really from then until now in, in a way that a lot of other comics aren't necessarily. And, and again, when you look at the timing, this is right before, like literally right before Fantastic Four number one and, and the launch of uh, you know, Marvel getting into this uh, Silver Age of Superheroes game. And, and it's a really interesting time when, when you look at that, when you see like what, what DC was doing and, you know, who they were working with, you, you know, just great imaginative people. Uh, Bob Kaniger in particular is someone who uh, I feel has been memory hold a lot. Uh, people forget he had a lot of contributions uh, to comics and is basically responsible for not just uh, the Silver Age Flash, but the Silver Age Wonder Woman, the Silver Age Suicide Squad, um, the Metal Men. He created the Metal Men over a weekend because they needed, uh, you know, some other thing to stuff in one of their books. And 
you know he was like all right and he came back with the metal men you, you, you know like he's he, he was he was a real powerful force and, and i mean obviously gardner fox I, I mean would go on and you know he's his uh contributions to to comics are you, you know we'll, we'll never know all of his contributions because of, of how often they didn't credit uh writers uh particularly at the at the time uh through the golden age and if you, you know, look at you... this comic book, there aren't any credits in it anywhere that says no. Gardner Fox wrote this. Like, you have to go online and research. Yeah, uh, you know, that and a lot of the future collections, the archive editions and stuff like that, did a pretty good job at doing as much research as they can and noting, like, even if they don't know who wrote it, they'll try to be like, we knew that, like, these handful of writers were working on the titles at the time, so it's one of them, but... But yeah, these the 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 contributions of people. Obviously, Carmen Infantino is uh, a, a celebrated uh, artist, uh, you know, at DC, and, and was closely associated the, with the Flash for a very long time. Uh, so, Eric, yeah. do you have anything else to say about uh, Flash One Twenty Three before we move on to the Wally West story? Uh, just that you know, anybody that's a, a fan of comics in general. Or you know, likes uh, likes the history of comics. Mm -hmm. This is a story that you know anybody that fits either of those criteria should read, as well as the books that came before and after, because it really it, it's it's a trip back to a simpler time. But if you just you know cut through the like I said the pointy fingers and the the you know like I said the walking you through stories, there's some really good creative ideas there and you do read this with just like a sense of fun and wonder and now again it's it's comic book history and it's i said I, you know i know i say this a lot but can't recommend this highly enough because it is just a lot of fun all right fun is the word with that comic and there's a lot of world building going on in flash 123 we move over to flash 54 this is a wally west flash from william mesner lobes with Blake, Greg LaRocque on art. Now, this really, is, there's not really any world building, or if it, it's minuscule in comparison to what mm -hmm. we get before. Well, here we almost get like a character celebration of who Wally West is and nobody dies. This is a much more, I don't know, like personal tale, Joe. Oh, yeah. This is, uh, this goes beyond just, um, uh, uh, oh. It, it almost surpasses just being a Wally West story. And it's a story about what it means to be a hero in one issue. Uh, you know, basically, and, and also, again, this is coming on the heels of Flash 53, which was um, when uh, the Pied Piper uh, came out as gay and uh, got Bill Loeb's the first ever uh, GLAAD award for a comic. Um, so that's like two key important Wally West issues back to back. That's another like it's a rare thing for one and done issues to be back to back like that. Uh, I love these yeah. one shot stories. Mm -hmm. I wish we got more of them. There's so much fun, and you do, you don't oh, yeah. feel so invested. You're like, oh my goodness, I have to wait another four months for this story. Did you get in this one? You get a complete telling of a story, and you get a lot of appreciation for the character, Eric. I know you said you hadn't read Flash 54 in some time. What, what were your thoughts just kind of rediscovering what this amazing story has to say? Just how much how much story could be told in one issue when it's done well. And I, I'll, I'll leave the, you know, the majority of the meat and potatoes to Joe on this one because I know this is, you know, you know um, a big one for him. But, I mean, just, just the setup, the, the way they did it, and then, you know, on the plane and the fact that half of the issue was devoted to just like an impossible rescue. And my, my favorite part of it was the, the mental anguish for about a page that Wally goes through, you know, where in his mind, he, he, he thinks it, he almost it's too freezes. late. Yeah, it's too late. I can't, you know, it's, but and then he goes, but they remember I'm not Superman. I can't fly. But he yeah. goes, you know, but then he starts thinking about the conversation he'd had with her, how well they'd hit it off. And then, the, you know, the, the rest of the story, what that deals with, it, it's just, it, it, it's really powerful. I mean, that's a, you mm -hmm. know, that is, 
you're kind of gripped in that last half of the of the issue. And I said, I'll, I at this point, we'll turn it over to Joe. So, yeah. so Joe, when we get into this, we'll talk about the very first half. We we meet the altered strain, which is, I guess, uh, some meta humans that maybe haven't discovered their powers yet. And they, they, they have a man captured in Flash. Wally West kind of defeats him in pretty short order. And that's kind of the introduction to the story. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it, again, this is great in terms of, you know, setting up a first issue because you can give this to anyone and it sets up, it it explains Wally's powers in a way that's engaging to a new reader who, who's never read the character before, as well as an old reader you know, I know what the Flash can do, but just the way they write it here, the way that uh, Bill Loeb's handles this, it's still engaging. And it's rare to find that, I, I feel. It, it it usually feels like, up oh, we're hitting the pause button on the story and the writer's turning around to tell you what this character can do, and then we'll hit on pause and keep going. But here, it all flows really well. And, uh, you know, Greg LaRock's art is also fantastic uh through this but you know i i guess if if you're aware of uh the invasion storyline and the ramifications from that this beginning part makes even more sense you don't really need to read that i don't think but but yeah there was a time in in dc comics where everything was tying into the uh the invasion and the metahumans that were unlocked from, and you're just like, I, I, I don't know. They, <laughs> they, uh, the hand was a little too heavy on, on that event. They, uh, they, uh, you know what? Joe, know. There was also a time when people liked Tom King's Batman. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it had to do with the very first issue where Batman is on a plane and it appears that he is about to die. And yep. Tom King himself has said that that is an homage to this very comic book. He has, indeed. It is public. It is on Twitter. You can look it up. But he loved this comic so much that that was one of the first things he did when he got the reins of Batman was to reference this comic. You, you know, because because it is that powerful as, as you're going through this. You know, and what makes it powerful, too, like you're going through it and... The, the second half where it's all on the plane and the plane uh, getting the hole in it and, and, and sucking the woman out. You're, you're reading through it and, and they do things like, you know, you can't hear what other people are saying. And it's all the in, all that internal monologue. But also, it, he's know. unaware of how much time has passed. He's like, yeah. I know I did all this stuff, but I was moving super speed. She got sucked out of the plane. She could be miles away by this point. He's like, so there's a lot of self doubt whether or not yeah. he can even do anything at this point. Yeah, it's great because this is this is like one of those like writer one hundred and one moments where you, you know a lot of people do the you know show don't tell. Here, you're only seeing Wally being heroic. You need those captions to understand that he is doubting himself the whole way through. And I think it's very relatable. I, I, I think we have all been, and probably every one of us who, who might be listening to this, have all been in a situation where you're like, you're trying to help a, a buddy or a family member out. And the whole time, even if it works, the whole time you're just thinking is you're helping this like, this is too much. Why did I, why'd I say yes? Why am I doing this? Why, why am I, like, here at three in the morning picking picking this person? You, you know, like, just that kind of stuff. But it, I think it it was so, uh, you know, earnest and, and relatable <laughs> in, in this. while And while he's doing nothing but being heroic. And, and it's, it's wonderful. I, I do want to point out that uh, Bill Mesner Loeb's, with just a few lines of dialogue, is able to successfully, like, show you there's a bit of a spark between Wally and... And this flight attendant. Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> it feels like natural dialogue. You're like, okay, these two have an, an attraction to each other. And it's within the span of a couple pages. Well, yeah. this this issue it works on so many levels because if you had been reading the Wally West Flash from the beginning when Mike Barron was writing him and through up to this point, the, the way they kind of 
Yeah, and it actually, some of this goes back to the Teen Titans, where Wally was a bit self-centered, mm-hmm. and he wasn't. I mean, he would do the right thing, but he may not always do it for the absolute right reason. So, the you know, Loeb's kind of you know, had Wally's character grow gradually. So, uh, you know, if this issue had happened in say issue ninety-five. The dialogue we got in 54 would not have happened because that Wally was no longer there. But there was still just enough of the, you know, she's probably already dead. I'm going to I'm going to risk my life for somebody who's already dead. I, I can't do this. I said. So there's a little bit of the self-centered Wally coming back. But then he goes. And then I remembered what she told me. I said, yo, she has a son. She wants to be a comedian. She's got life. She's got a life plan. She's got plans. And then he realizes that he is that hero. And. You know he's going to try all along, mm-hmm. but the 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 self doubt he goes through that that would have not existed fifty issues prior or you know you past that. Yeah. So it was you know a good like capsule for where Wally was at this particular time. And I you know looking back and reading that, I said I would have kind of liked to have seen that go somewhere. Mm-hmm. I can't remember if they introduced Linda yet or not because I, I get the timeline because Wally was also. He was a bit of a player in those days. Yes. Yeah. So it was, it, it wasn't a stretch that, you know, they would, that sparks would fly between an attractive flight attendant and an attractive young man. So yeah, that, that, that fit the story as well. But so I said, this is, you know, right place, right time for the story to really hit on all cylinders. Yeah, no, a- absolutely. There, there's just so much going here. And, and again, this, this works so well for the flash uh, because if, if you swap some things out and you made this a, a Superman story where he's like saving Lois Lane or something like that, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be as tense because you'd know there would, there would be no doubt in your mind that Superman would save Lois. In here, we've never seen this iteration Wally West do, do this before. And it's a character we don't really know. So it adds a lot to to the tension because it's like hey m- maybe she doesn't make it maybe the maybe the plane doesn't make it because there's also the threat of as he's going through this like i i, I abandoned the, the plane to, to save this you know woman what what if they need me up there? you know there, there's all these things going on so your mind is racing with wally's which, which also, add, it, it just, it, it's so rare to to find like all of these things kind of meshing together all at once to create this sort of atmosphere in, in a big two comic where you're dealing with, you know, the assembly line of multiple people's input, um, you, you know, uh, to have a writer and an artist like be so in sync to get this story across to have editors that'll let you do it. It's like, it's, it's great that it all came together to, to allow a a comic like this to come out. So once he's jumped out of the plane and he accidentally shoots past this flight at that, and he finally kind of gets back to her and you're like, well, what's he going to do now? He can't fly. Is he going to shoot for a building and try to run down the building and hope everything kind of goes okay. He says he wants to find some water. There's no water. It's clear that he's over a city. What do you think about the, the, the finality and the way that they are able to explain how, how Wally West and this woman live? Yeah, no, it's, I mean, well, going through it, it it's the whole thing. They, it's a lot of setup payoff leading up to all this too. Cause um, you know, he hasn't eaten and they establish again, you know, he needs to, his metabolism's too high from his powers. So, um, you know, you have that like sweet little moment where um, she happens to have peanuts uh, because as he's doing all this, he's trying to fly and basically like running too fast. It's like, you know, my legs are burning. I can't do this. I, I need this. I need that. They're falling. They see the skyline. And he's like, I think I can move us to land in the trees. Like, oh, there's trees over there. I can do this. And and and, and to get that confirmation that the, um, you know, the plane landed everyone's all right you know and and then just that last panel with them together you know it's a rule nobody dies like 
it's and this is well before um you know what was it i think doctor who did that bit too for for the finale and the third season with the master with the whole bit like nobody dies and all that but but yeah it's it's just great it's just a nice finite ending she's fine everyone's okay um you know i i love that finality to it it's just it's it's over we get we got to see that aspect of him just saving the one person i I think a lot of other writers would have rather stuck with i'm just gonna have I'm going to figure out a way to keep Wally in the plane or like he's going to go out, save her and then get back in the plane and and fight the bad guys and all that. And and it's when you read this, you understand like, oh, that would have been that would have been like the easy way out. That would have been the like traditional been there, done that kind of I've seen those in comics before. I've seen the Flash and all these other superheroes uh, take out some terrorists on a plane or you know, terrorists holding hostages. This was the more interesting path to follow. If you think about it, in this issue alone, we got that set up, the first scene where the bad guy knocks the one guy, you know, off the building and Wally has time to save him and get right back up there and stop the bad guy. So yeah. the way they set it up, you're thinking the same thing is going to happen again. They're going to do it twice. Mm-hmm. And then that's where you get the real impact of the story was that it's not. Now, they do say that, you know, him taking care of the hijackers was easy for him. Mm -hmm. The conflict is because the flight attendant has been sucked out of the hole. And, Mm -hmm. you know, there's, you know, now at at the time he, his powers had developed enough where he had some kind of aura that he was hoping could protect both of them. So obviously no matter what he does without that, they're street pizza. But he enough to, to make it possible for what he did to work. And there's a, there's a little line where when she feeds him the peanuts and he, it says, you know, good peanuts. It's like, <laughs> you feel like hey, that's that's. You know, yeah. And, and, and they said they set it up and she made a joke about that on the plane. You know, when he said he was good, you know, she, he would see if she could find him something to eat. And that that comes into play in an entirely different fashion later. It's just what his, what his books that, you know. If you're not paying attention, you just, like if you're just reading it in a trade, you may not even notice it as yeah. is, is standing out from the ones before, especially as Joe said, you had a kind of a you know a mic drop issue the, the issue before. But when you just look at it at, you know in a, you know just picking up and reading it as a single issue, you realize just how good a single issue can be. Yeah. Very well said, Eric. Joe, since I, I know this is your favorite, well, one of your favorite comics, I'll let you have it's the last okay. word as we wrap up this Flash Essentials. Yeah, um, uh, some of these stories are, are available. The Silver Age stuff is luckily in omnibus and um, softcover format. This particular issue, uh, Flash 54, is collected in the Flash 80th anniversary uh, hardcover they came out with. Uh so if, if you prefer getting hardcover, you able like to that. find them in your dollar bins too, right? Yeah, no, I mean, you can find a lot of Loeb's run in the dollar bins, which is, uh, you, know, you know, again, which is a shame. There's a lot of comics that, you know, you pay a lot more money and you won't get anything close to this. But um, if you go to almost any uh, comic shop with a decent back issue section, you'll probably find a lot of uh, Loeb's uh, Flash in there. Um, also, if you like trades, they did do uh, the Flash Savage Velocity, which is all of Mike Barron's Flash, and then I think like the first like three issues of, of Bill Loeb's run. So it's the post-crisis stuff. If, if you like picking those up, pick up those trades, because if those trades do well... The, hopefully the idea is they'll keep going through Loeb's run because it would be great if we could get that collected because it, it is truly a a total like mind blown I can't believe they're doing this like they they've collected so much flash in and around but Loeb's run is like almost completely uncollected 
Uh, a lot of Carrie Bates run uh, leading up to, to Crisis there. The guy who basically wrote like three quarters uh, or more of the Bronze Age Flash. Almost none of that's collected. They're finally collecting uh, the death of Iris West. Um, spoilers. But <laughs> they're, no uh, joke. <laughs> you know, that's that's the name of the book. You can't, but um, they're they're finally collecting that. But but yeah, there's a lot of Flash stuff, a lot of classic Flash stuff that isn't collected. Uh, some of it's finally coming out. Keep your eye out for it. And uh, definitely check, uh, you know, back issue bins for Loeb's run. Loeb's is a criminally underrated writer uh, and artist in his own right. But, um, it, you know, his work, particularly on Flash and, and Wonder Woman, uh, really stand out. All right, Phil, I want to say, say thank you very much for joining me for, the, for this comic book retrospective. Next time we're going to talk Fantastic Four, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Boom. So that'd be a lot of fun. I'll announce what issues that we're going to be talking about on the Comics Aficionados. And we'll see you all later. Thank you very much. Take care.